Matthew, I, I definitely was interested in the story of June, but then again, I'm biased, aren't I? So, <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here with you all. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Diversify, uh, why I decided to write the book, uh, my own experiences, uh, and what I think we can do uh, to create a more inclusive uh, and diverse uh, society. So I'll start a little bit with my own story. Um, as the daughter of Ghanaian immigrants, I have always been fascinated with mythology uh, and storytelling and the power it has to shape our opinion of ourselves and also our view of the world around us. Now, Ghanaian culture is steeped uh, in storytelling and mythology that's passed on from generation to generation through an oral tradition. So my grandmother uh, died when I was very young. So my great-grandmother uh, became sort of my de facto, de facto grandmother. And she would come over from Ghana twice a year, and she didn't speak English, but luckily I spoke our mother tongue, Tree. And I would remember sitting in between her legs, and she would braid my hair. And I had, like, at the time, big, thick Afro hair. So it was very painful. Um, so didn't enjoy the braids, but enjoyed her storytelling. And she would tell me about all of the stories from our culture. And one of the stories in particular was that of a Nancy the spider. Uh, now, I'm sure most of you have read uh, Joseph Campbell, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Uh, well, he looks at the Anansi story. And Anansi is probably the most important uh, folktale in African and Caribbean uh, culture. And so the Anansi story goes a little bit like this. So Anansi starts out as uh, the lowest spider in the animal kingdom and decides that he wants to somehow rise to the top and realizes there's only one way to do it, which is to become the owner of the stories of the world. And those stories are currently uh, uh, in the possession of the sky god. So he goes to the sky god and he says, I want to buy your stories. And the sky god says to him, what makes you think you, a low spider, can buy the stories? And he says, plus, uh, we had the kings of all of our great nations come and they all failed. So why do you think you can? So Anansi says, no, I think I can do it. Anyway, the sky god is now on the back foot. So he says, all right, okay, go and try so being a lowly spider, you know, you're often used to hearing no, so you have to sort of innovate, as it were. So Anansi comes up with lots of little ploys to actually get the things that the sky god asks for. So he goes back to the sky god and he says, look, I've done it. So the sky god is very impressed and, and, and gives him the stories. And as a result, Anansi becomes the top of the animal kingdom and shares these stories uh, with the rest of the world. Now, the reason I reference the Anansi story is because there are two themes in it that I want to talk to you about today. The first is, even though the sky god didn't think that Anansi could complete the task, he still gave him the same opportunity anyway, the same opportunity that he had given far worthier candidates uh, before. But the second element is that Anansi believed in himself. And I believe when you have those two elements that anything uh, is possible. So up until a few years ago, I was living and working in America. Um, and like most uh, British entertainment talent, uh, wanted to try and crack America, as it were. Uh, and I'm uh, sad to say I, I didn't crack America, but maybe made a little dent on her east and west coast. And with what's happened in the last year, probably better, don't you think? Um, <laughs> And so uh, a few years ago, I was working in Las Vegas and uh, a young man appeared on set who was covered head to toe in tattoos um, and what appeared to be gang markings, at least that's the assumption that I made. And I have to be honest, immediately I felt uncomfortable around him. I started behaving weirdly, avoiding eye contact um, and just was aware of his presence. Now, I grew up in a council estate uh, in East London, so it wasn't as if I wasn't used to men like this, but I just wasn't used to men like him in that particular context. Um, I've been a, a real outspoken critic of the lack of diversity in my industry, but even um, when that status quo was challenged, even I had to adjust. So in that, minute, it was a in that moment, it was a real light bulb moment for me because I understood this issue from both sides. As a woman of color, I've always seen this issue from being on the receiving end as opposed to uh, doing it myself. 
And I had no idea that I had these limiting beliefs and these isms. And I think the thing is, for me, I think when we use extreme words like racism, straight away, a wall goes up. And actually, that's not what it is. I like to call it otherizing. It's just encountering somebody that you perceive to be different and for whatever reason, feeling uncomfortable. I need to, yeah, sorry. It's, it's encountering, oh, that's better, isn't it? Yeah, good. Well, you've got about 10 minutes at this new pitch. Um, it's encountering somebody that you perceive to be different and feeling uncomfortable um, as a result of that. So what I look at in Diversify is how we move beyond our isms and how we connect with the other, whatever that other is for you. Is it still too low? Yeah? yeah? Okay, let's try this. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. Okay, we're going to keep it here. Um, yeah? Yeah, should I do that? I might sing you a song if you're lucky. Uh, then again, no, trust me, you don't want me to do that. <laughs> so it's encountering difference and, and being aware when you feel uncomfortable with that difference. And so when I started writing Diversify, I didn't just want to look at stories and anecdotes. I actually wanted to present hard evidence and data. So I teamed, with, uh, teamed up with uh, Nuffield College, uh, Oxford University. And what we've done is presented the data on all of the various other groups. And for me, diversity is all encompassing. I look at six key groups that I feel are disenfranchised in society and offer solutions about how we better include them. So these groups are the other man, uh, which is disenfranchised men, uh, gender, LGBTQ, class, age, and, and I think particularly in the UK, class is such a big one for us. Uh, and then I also look at disability. And so what I found is the sort of key groups that you expect to be the worst uh, discriminated against are actually, yes, that's all true, but actually the group that I found the most, that I found the most shocking was those with disabilities. You know, there are over a million people in this country with a disability that are actively looking for work that can't find work as a result of their affliction. There are 1.4 million people in this country with a learning disability. Only 6% of them are in work. That is such a waste of talent. And for me, this isn't a case of altruism. It's a case of just the smart thing to do because you don't know. It may be these groups that we've ignored that may have the solutions to some of the problems we now see ourselves faced with. So what I'd like to do is uh, read a little bit uh, from the book. Um, and how it works is each chapter starts with an other group uh, and we look at, I look at the old way and then present the other way in terms, how, in terms of how things could be. So I'm going to read you a little bit from the other man uh, and the old way of that section and hopefully you'll be able to hear me. Making up more than half of the world's population, women are probably the largest other group. But it's the other man that I want to discuss first. If you genuinely want to identify and understand the other man, and the fact that you've chosen to read this book gives me confidence that you do, he is not hard to find. The other man is a diverse group found across the Western world in working class communities, blue collar jobs, and weekend football matches. These are the men I was raised by and raised with. They have been taught from a young age not to cry, not to be a sissy, and to stand up for themselves. They are more likely to have been celebrated by their peers and perhaps even their teachers for their physical prowess more than their mental agility. The other man is black, Muslim, or white working class, and each group is the victim of their otherness in a different way but each will have been taught to understand early on the importance of being able to provide for himself and his family, and each will have encountered barriers in trying to achieve this. Discrimination against men is important to address because of the impact it has on the rest of society. The exclusion of the other man can often have violent and devastating consequences. This isn't always the case, obviously, but men have a different way of dealing with fear and frustration to women 
as does each person to the next. Some of this is due to socialization. Some of it is pure biology. Leading neuroscientist Dr. James Fallon explained to me that our genetics can result in striking differences in our response to stress, abuse, and rejection. People with vulnerability forms of genes are extremely impacted, while those with highly protective genes are remarkably resistant. This suggests that some people are more genetically likely than others to develop damaging responses to environmental stresses, such as depression, PTSD, substance abuse, and personality disorders. And says Dr. Fallon, males often have poorer mood and personality outcomes than females. So men are in fact more vulnerable to exclusion than women, and no man, no matter how much he may have been taught to suppress his emotions, is immune to its effect. We've seen this in action throughout the UK and the US in recent years. The failure of these societies to prevent the economic and social exclusion of their other men has weakened and divided communities and created a ticking time bomb that we must deactivate. It has caused feelings of inferiority and led to a fractured society. It has, comp it has compromised social mobility and created artificial bubbles whereby the situation you are born into dictates your job and educational prospects. It has opened the doors to radical groups and nurtured breeding grounds of extremism. In short, it has led to a lack of diversity, which then leads to a lack of empathy on both sides. Cue demagogues fanning the flames of division for political ends. For it has been the exclusion of the other man with muscle, where it still counts, at the ballot box, that has had the most profound implications. In the UK, the white working class male vote delivered the shattering of Britain's 40-year union with Europe. In America, it brought about the election of Donald Trump, a president with zero experience in public office and some unsavory views and conduct. Whatever your opinion on either Trump or Brexit, 2016 provided the two most extreme examples in recent history of how a marginalized group can dictate the social and economic future of society. And of course, politics aside, the exclusion of any man, any other man, impacts more than just him. His family will share the impact of his pain, sometimes literally, if alcohol and low self-esteem are a part of the toxic mix. This scenario played out within the family has a multi-generational impact and can cost the state millions of pounds in welfare and social services professionals called in to address family breakdown and deprivation. Failing to diversify and include all other men is not something we can afford economically or socially. Quite simply, it will cost a lot less financially, but also in pain and suffering, to expand opportunities to the other man rather than to continue to exclude him. While preparing to write this book, I wrote to three such others, prisoners in the UK, with strikingly similar stories. Young men, one black, one Muslim, and one white working class, who all at once had dreams that turned into nightmares. You'll find their letters in response to mine at diversify.org. I read their personal accounts of how life had taken them on a path that led to prison. A powerful line from philosopher Susan Griffin's A Chorus of Stones, The Private Life of War, kept running through my mind. There is a circle of humanity, he told me, and I can feel its warmth, but I'm forever outside. And this circle of humanity excluded them behind bars too. The Young Report found that in 2014, most of the prisoners said that they experienced differential treatment as a result of their race, ethnicity, or faith. Black prisoners felt they were stereotyped as drug dealers and Muslim prisoners as terrorists. These young men may not possess the tools to express themselves as eloquently as Griffin's subjects, but their words of despair and hopelessness are no less powerful. They are men who, thanks to mass social media and globalization, knew what bounties the modern world had to offer, yet felt that they and their kind were not wanted, valued, or needed. Is it any wonder they ended up where they did? So I'll end by saying, I'm not an economist, but I am a pragmatist, and I believe the economy that's sufficient enough to create a framework that enables everybody to contribute the, to the best of their ability will indeed become the world leader. So thank you.